happen today, I'm going to be discussing the topic of assertiveness. Uh, for Laura, she was feeling uh, some anxiety, but also she was going through an identity crisis, uh, meaning that she felt like she didn't know who she was. So she actually went to her therapist and said, hey, I don't, I feel like I don't know who I am. And the therapist wisely guided her to the specifics of her situation. Is there anywhere in your life where you feel like you're not speaking up for yourself or you feel like you're holding back you're 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 clenching in you're 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 suppressing yourself and she said well yeah so a situation happened where i got two letters in the mail in the same week one letter was from the college of my dreams and the other letter was from the college that my mom graduated from immediately it becomes apparent what the issue may be She's, she's feeling conflicted because she feels a pressure to go to her mother's college because she, she feels that would please her mom. But at the same time, she really wanted to go to this other college and she's accepted to both. And now she doesn't know what to do. In fact, the conflict is so intense that she feels like she doesn't know who she is. So she had a discussion with the therapist. The therapist said, well, okay, well, let's, let's work on uh, figuring out how you might approach her mom and, and talk to her, tell her how you're feeling to, to assert yourself. And so they found nice, kind ways that she could approach her mom respectfully and, and assert her, her viewpoint and, uh, and express herself. And, and she did this. She went, she talked to her mom, and they ended up having a, a really good dis discussion. And in the end, she decided to go to the college that she wanted to go to. And when she came back to her next session, she told her therapist she was ready to terminate sessions. The therapist said, well, well what about your identity crisis? She said, I don't have that anymore. It all came down to the specifics. You see, when a person is holding back, when they're being too nice, when they're being too worried about what other people are thinking, they're suppressing the self and they may cause themselves an identity crisis. At minimum, they're going to feel all types of anxiety and eventually depression. If a person comes from a background of complex trauma, if they come from a household where there was a caregiver that was harsh and demeaning, demanding, they may have learned to be in fear of speaking up in that household. They may have learned that it was un unacceptable to have a different opinion than their caregiver. And for them to express such, they would get torn down, humiliated, belittled, hurt, embarrassed, physically punished ostracized. And so they learn at a young age to suppress that need, to suppress that desire to assert themselves. And instead, they learn to be pleasing, to go along with the flow, to ride under the radar, to smile at their parents, to smile in public. And they start using this, this, this gift of pleasing to go through their whole lives. And they go and become high achievers and, and people pleasers in high school, college, and it kind of works to a degree. I mean, they always got good grades and their teachers like them, but it causes a lot of problems. They get bullied uh, through school. They don't feel like they're being respected. And at night they feel sad. They may cry themselves to sleep as a result. All of this comes from that family of origin, not being a safe place for them to develop their skills of self-assertiveness. Like Laura, they feel like they can't express who they truly are, what they truly want, how they truly feel. And every time they hold back, they're holding themselves back, they're suppressing themselves, they're actually causing themselves further trauma. The suppressing of the self is a trauma in itself. And so as a result, they feel like they don't even know who they are. Can you relate to Laura? Can you relate to a feeling like this? Like you don't know really what you want at times. You don't know uh, really what your identity is. You know your name, but you don't know um, what, what you, who you feel like you've lost yourself as a result of trying to please everyone else. It could feel like being assertive is being mean. 
or that you would risk being mean or you would risk hurting someone's feelings. But the truth is that assertiveness is your door to freedom. If you learn the skill of assertiveness, if you learn to stop being nice, you can start being happy. If you learn to stop being nice, to stop trying to please everyone else, your anxiety will just drop, it will plummet, and your depression will just drop, and your happiness will go up, and your ability to to feel like you know yourself, your identity, your self-esteem, your self-worth will skyrocket. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing you can't do. When you're feeling a sense of worth, esteem, confidence, when you know who you are and you're not living in anxiety and fear, it just opens up so many, so many options for you in your life. Imagine what you could have done if you, if you didn't live your life in fear up to this point. Is it that simple? Yes, it's that simple. It comes down to your ability to show up authentically. But you can't be authentic without a little controversy, can you? And so your desire to avoid conflict, to avoid controversy, is causing you to hide yourself. And your desire to hide your feelings is causing you to become invisible in this world. And we don't do well when we're invisible. You, you the human spirit, feels tamped, tampered down when it's invisible. You will not function well. Your emotional health will suffer. Your metaphysical health suffers, your mental peace is gone when you're holding back, when you're biting your tongue, when you're not being authentic. You must learn to assert yourself. Because your purpose on this earth is not to please everyone else. It doesn't make sense. Because it's impossible. Can you name a human being that has pleased everyone? that no one dislikes, that no one is displeased with, that no one is against, it doesn't exist. Only invisible people. But you don't want to live your life being non-consequential. You want to live your life living up to your potential. And to do that, you must learn to speak up for yourself. As you learn in, in the video I have on my YouTube about boundaries, you must view yourself as your own sovereign nation. So you're like a country that has its borders that need to be protected. The way that you protect your borders is by setting your boundaries. Boundaries are rules that you create for yourself. Borders are the space, the, the line around a country. Your boundaries create an outline of the self. So when you express boundaries, it shows where you are. It shows other people where you are. And it shows yourself where you are. It gives you the space to exist. That's the beauty of boundaries. Closely related to boundaries is the skill of assertiveness, because in order to express boundaries to people, you must have the ability, the gift, the talent of speaking up, of asserting yourself. But how? How can I assert myself? It's so difficult. I've learned only to, I've learned only to please others. I thought it was good to be nice. Niceness is not a virtue. If you look up niceness in the dictionary, you'll find one of the descriptive words is pleasing. You're pleasing. That's what being nice is. You've learned to appease everyone and make sure everyone is not mad at you. That's people pleasing. Being a people pleaser is not a virtue. A people pleaser is a liar. A person who just simply aspires to be nice is at risk of being inauthentic, is at risk of being a liar. Don't aspire to be nice. You should be kind, right? Because you look kindness up and one of the descriptive words is generous. A kind person is coming from a place of abundance. A kind person is coming from a place of love. A nice person, a pleaser, is coming from a place of fear. Oh, no, I'm really afraid. I don't want to hurt anyone, so I just want to. And then we're just pleasing, 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 and appeasing. You don't want to live your life in fear. You want to live your life according to love. 
according to your, your visions of the future, your dreams. Be dream-based, love-motivated. So you can be kind to people. The difference is that is the origin place of where that niceness is coming from. Likewise, in terms of biting your tongue, don't confuse that with being patient. Being patience, patience is a virtue. You just, you're just holding your tongue, just sitting there being silent while someone is irritating you, doing something that's irritating you, doing something that's making you mad. That's not authentic. That's not, that's not true patience. Why? Again, because you're holding your tongue out of fear. That's not where patience comes from. Patience co comes from a place of love and generosity. Patience is a virtue. You see, a person whose patient is able to sit through a situation, is able to suffer through an inconvenience with positive thoughts maintained. Positive thoughts are positive emotions. So a person whose patient is centered, they're actualized. A person who's just holding back, biting their tongue, who's just pleasing, <laughs> who's being silent, they're inauthentic, and they're not maintaining positive thoughts, are they? They're thinking, oh, you son of a gun, oh, oh if I could just, mm, 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 I don't know what to say, I don't know what to do, and they're feeling angry, and it's bottling up, and it's bottling up, and then eventually, what happens? They explode. That's what happened to Jessica. She was in the cell phone shop. She was waiting her turn and waiting. And then another couple walks in. And sure enough, the attendant gives attention to the other couple and passes her right by, although she had been sitting there and waiting. And so she's just sitting there and she's not saying anything, but she's thinking everything. And all these thoughts are going through her head and all these emotions are boiling up. And then finally, what happens? She can't wait any longer. And so she explodes. And she, and she, 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 she is hyper-confrontational. She has a confrontation with the store clerk. And she didn't tell me all the details, but she told me she felt regret for the way she handled the situation. Relatable, right? And that's what happens. That's what happens when we when we choose to be nice, to be pleasing, instead of being assertive. You see, assertiveness is something that will happen long before the blow up. And when we exercise patience and assertiveness, then we're able to always be in our center and represent ourselves authentically. And we don't have to deal with anxiety. We don't have to deal with regret. And we don't have to deal with loss of self. And we don't have to be called a Karen because we, we lost our, our temper. We stayed under control. We don't have to have regrets because we spoke up for ourselves. Do you want to learn how to be assertive? That's what we're going to teach you right here, right now today. We're going to do it as a workshop. Right here, right now for free, we are going to learn the skill of assertiveness, how to step up, how to speak up for ourselves. Right? Because we need to know how to use our, our defense mechanisms. And your anger is a defense mechanism. The anger that you're feeling is a defense mechanism. It motivates you to act. But when you don't know how to use it properly, you'll be like a sovereign nation with, with an arms arsenal that holds back, doesn't do anything until they just drop the nukes. You don't want to default to the nuclear bomb. Don't just default to exploding. And then your other mechanism is just to hold back. Learn to use your full arsenal, the full array of tools at your disposal. And that's where assertiveness comes in and patience comes in. It allows you to show up to these situations, to respond to these situations, to become equal to the challenge that is ahead of you. So what are you afraid of? What holds you back from being assertive? Some people are afraid of what's going to happen if they are assertive, if they tell their, their husband or their, their wife or their mom or their dad, or their brother, sister, or the person who they work for exactly how they're feeling in a moment, they speak up for themselves. They're afraid of what the blowback is going to be.
So let's analyze that for a moment. Are you afraid of what the blowback is going to be? Skip to the worst case scenario. What's ultimately going to happen? What you're afraid of, what you're afraid of is exactly what you want to happen. If you're afraid of how they're going to respond, you see, because their response is what you need to determine if you should keep them in your life. Instead of worrying that they're going to abandon you, you must be thinking, do I want them in my life? And how will I know if they're really a good person if I don't see how they respond to me when I speak up for my needs? You see, because someone who's worthy of sticking around in your life will respond to your needs with respect, with understanding, with a listening ear, with humility. They will be able to accept criticism, counsel. They will recognize that they're not perfect. And so when you speak up and you say, oh, you know what? Do you mind doing the such and such? Or could you not do the so-and-so? They're going to say, I'm so sorry. I would never want to do something that would make you feel uncomfortable. And then you know, oh, this is a, this is a decent person to have in my life. See, but, but that's a storybook fantasy for you, right? Because you're thinking about that narcissist in your life. What's going to happen if you stand up to that narcissist and you assert yourself to that narcissist? How are they going to respond? Well, well you know, they're going to lose it. That is exactly what you need to see. Because how they respond to you expressing your needs is what shows you if you can be in a relationship with them or not. As soon as you see that they are unable to accept any responsibility, they cannot accept that they are imperfect, they cannot accept that you have needs, they, they, they throw up a temper tantrum, they make a big deal out of the situation, they exaggerate, they triangulate, and they do all the craziness, then you know, oh, that's not the one for me. I'm going to have to separate myself from that person. Just that simple. Then you know that they are sick. That's how you know who's toxic. And you've asked that question. You said, How do I can't find any of the good men out here? Th- speak up. The good men will reveal themselves in how they respond to your assertiveness. It's the same vice versa. You're looking for the good women. Speak up. The good women will show themselves by how they respond to your assertiveness, the narcissist will show up because they will throw a temper tantrum. I was just watching TikTok today. A woman, grown woman was throwing a full-fledged temper tantrum because her boyfriend wanted to break up with her because she cheated. (laughs) They will throw a temper tantrum. Grown people. Why? Because their, their development was arrested in their childhood. Why? Because of the trauma they experienced. They decided that they were going to be a manipulator, a user, and an abuser. And that's how they were going to get what they needed out of this world. They've gone to the dark side. Separate yourselves from these individuals. Assertiveness will expose them. Speak up. Well, I'm afraid that I'll hurt them if I I speak up for myself. Or I'm afraid that I'm going to feel guilty if I speak up for myself. Is that how you feel? Afraid of hurting the other person and that you're going to feel guilty. If you see your child running across the street and there's a car coming, are you going to hesitate to physically grab that child by the arm, pull them out of the street? It's your duty, it's your responsibility to protect the child. Are you afraid that you're going to hurt the child? You see, there's times where hurting someone becomes secondary in importance isn't there. So don't say I'm afraid I'm going to hurt a person. And so therefore, I cannot even speak up for myself. So I'll just lose myself. I'll lose my mental health. I'll lose my emotional health. So I don't hurt the other person. That's, that's not, that's not balanced. What's balanced is that you treat everyone the same way you would treat yourself and treat yourself the same way you treat everyone else. And so if you would speak up for another person whose rights are being trampled on, then you must speak up for yourself when your rights are being trampled on. If you would speak up for a friend or family member who has a preference, then you speak up for yourself 
when you have a preference, it is your responsibility to assert yourself. It is your responsibility to assert yourself, despite the fact that someone may get hurt. That how a person responds to the pain of a correction is what exposes if they are a narcissist. You have been asking, how do I know if a person is a narcissist? Hurt them. <laughs> Stop being afraid to, to tell them something that is constructive, that may sting a little bit. That is how you see who they really are. We all have to go through this world feeling around and realize that certain things hurt. We, 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 we put our hand on a, on a thorn and we realize that that's, that, that hurts. It's a part of life. Pain is not the biggest enemy. The fact that you might accidentally cause someone a little bit of pain when your only objective was just to express your boundaries that shouldn't stop you from expressing your boundaries. If the boundary was there, then you express there's a boundary right here, whether it's going to hurt someone's feelings or not. You understand? Is this making sense to you? Guilt is not an excuse to not do what needs to be done. Maybe you will feel guilty. Often you will not because your guilt should be associated with doing what is right. When you recognize that what is right is asserting yourself, asserting your boundaries, expressing your preferences, your concerns, your likes, dislikes, wants, and needs, that is what's right. So there's really no reason to feel guilt. That would be disordered guilt to feel guilty for doing that. But if you did feel a little bit guilty because maybe you thought you did maybe hurt someone or maybe you felt you didn't say it perfectly, that may come. Except that you'll feel that guilt because guilt for one day or two days or one week, however long you expect this guilt to last, is not going to last as long as mental illness that is a direct result of constricting the self of being non-assertive, assert yourself. For many people, they feel like, you know, I know how to just bite my tongue and I know how to drop the nuclear bomb, but how do I find that middle ground? That's why I feel like I don't know, I don't know how to find the middle ground. Remember, our thoughts, our perception is what dictates the emotions. And the emotions tend to precede the actions, right? So when we keep our thoughts balanced, we have balanced emotions. When we keep our perceptions balanced, we have balanced emotions. All emotions come from your perceptions of a situation. It doesn't come from this situation. Two people can be in the same situation and their perception is different of it. So they have different emotions. Just that simple. Your house burns down. It could be a, your roommate lives in the same house. They could be happy because from their perception, they're getting insurance money. You could be sad because from your perception, you lost something that was very valuable to you. The same thing happens to the same people. It is different. How they feel is based on their perception. So please recognize that if you don't want to have the extreme to the right or the extreme to the left response, then you need to stop thinking in extremes. And to stop thinking in extremes, you have to get out of the fear-based mindset. Your limbic brain system is the system that is uh, guided by fear. It's the fight, flight, freeze part of your brain. If you get out of the limbic brain space system and you get into the cerebral cortex, now you are thinking in full color. When you're in the cerebral cortex, you're able to analyze all the intricacies of something which balances out your viewpoint, which balances your perception, which balances your emotions, which balances your actions. Right? So if I'm standing in a situation and there's an injustice, like someone cuts in line in front of me or someone takes something out of my card or there's some weird injustice that's happening to me in everyday life. When I realize, look, this is not a survival situation. I get out of the fear mindset and I get into the cerebral cortex and I start analyzing the situation. Well, maybe they have something going on in their life. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe I'm right. And maybe I should speak up. And now it's a lot easier to assert myself on that middle option and not 
the fault of the nukes or just cowering and hiding because I've balanced my perception by analyzing. So use your cerebral cortex, analyze in real time. Balanced perceptions will give you balanced emotions. Balanced emotions will give you balanced reactions. So what is a balanced reaction to someone cutting in line? Well, it's to use your voice. In fact, there's multiple tools that we can utilize as discussed in the assertiveness part one training video that's on my YouTube. Uh, I'll briefly uh, go through the, the, the 10 tools in the toolbox. And then as a group, we can start utilizing these tools so that you can practice being assertive. Okay, so the act of being assertive is essentially just to say or do something. It is to, it is to use your voice, okay? So that's the number one tool in the toolbox is to use your voice. That means that even grunting is assertive. So, so you could be in a situation and there's a guy or girl and they're pressing up on your boundaries. Even just moaning or grunting is an assertion of something. Then at least they see something is wrong because you're saying something. For instance, I can be in the cell phone shop and just use my voice without articulating anything. I don't have to have specific words. I can just say, uh, and then throw my hands up like this and look around like that, and I'll get the attention I need. <laughs> How many words did I use? Zero. Zero of those words are in the dictionary. So, so you don't have to be articulate to start being assertive. You can start doing that today. It's not so much always that you have to have the perfect words. It helps if you do, which brings us to the second tool in the toolbox, which is build your vocabulary. Make it a point to practice mentally scenarios on how you would assert yourself like we're going to do today and when you hear big words learn those words when you hear words that describe emotions learn those words build your vocabulary so that you become more articulate and when you are more articulate you have more confidence to speak up for yourself so that's another key to being assertive another tool in your toolbox is to pause seven seconds Always, before you respond or react to a situation, pause seven seconds. Another tool in the toolbox is to always make sure you remain calm. Your, your objective is not to be to respond in anger or, or, not, to, or not to respond in, in tears, but to respond with, with a sense of calm, to stay right in the middle, balance, balance thoughts, balance emotions, balance actions. A, a really nice tool in the toolbox, and again, this video is on YouTube, you can, you can go take a look at it, is put your assertion in question form. It's a very nice way of asserting yourself. So, so at work, when, when your boss, he just told you that the deadline was going to be Friday, and now today, he says the deadline's Thursday. Instead of just being like, you said the deadline's Friday, you can put it in question form and just say, okay, uh, is the deadline Thursday or did I hear you say that it was Friday? I don't remember. Another good tool is to use the sandwich technique. Sandwich technique is where you place on top of the, the point of uh, concern that you're asserting. You put a compliment, something nice, something fluffy, something that feels good. And then you put the meat in the middle, the concern that you're asserting. And then below, you, you put something fluffy on the bottom. So this would look like you're talking to a coworker or something like that. And they're super annoying because they chew their gum. They smack their gum loud in your ear. <laughs> and so you say to them, you know, over this last uh, three months of working with you, I really have enjoyed myself. There's my top part of my sandwich. Then I say, um, I would enjoy myself even more if when you were chewing your gum, it wasn't as loud in my ear. And then you hit them with the second part of the bun on the bottom, something fluffy. And then you say, uh, but other than that, I have to say, you're one of my favorite coworkers it's a lot easier for the person to receive what you're saying with less hurt feelings, 
when you're using the sandwich technique. So give compliments. That's a way of asserting yourself to say something in a way that's loving, that's kind, that's complimentary, that's building the ego. Give compliments, give commendation, use the sandwich technique. Another important tool is to stick to the point when you're asserting yourself. It's not time to get into an argument about anything. So if you're dealing with someone who wants to take you off and say, well, the other day you blah, 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 to say, okay, I mean, if you have an issue with me, that's fine. And you can bring that up another time. But I actually called this meeting to tell you about my issue. Stick to your point. That's how you assert yourself. Another tool is to avoid toxic people. It is asserting yourself to walk away when the situation is toxic. Leave when the person is toxic. Get away from them. Avoid them. Another tool that's discussed in the video is recognizing that it, there's no right or wrong, which helps you to not, to not get angry. It's not about right and wrong all the time. It's, it's viewpoints. It's personal preference. And so you're not saying, hey, it's wrong that you don't fill up your car all the way when you're at the gas. You just say, you know, it's my preference, babe, that, that you would just fill it up all the way. That's my preference. It's not about right and wrong. It's personal preference. So hopefully you found these, uh, these tools helpful and you can get a more detailed discussion on utilizing these tools um, on, on that video that's on YouTube. You go to YouTube, type in Roman Zanoni and those videos come up, you go to the channel and then you'll be rocking. So, so let's, let's practice this together here and I'll give you an example. So like, let's say I'm, I'm in the cell phone shop and uh, as someone cuts in front of me, uh, a way that I could use my voice, I demonstrated, I could just moan, right? Or I can articulate myself. Maybe I would ask a question and, and, and I would even um, soften it by, by, by putting blame on myself. So I might say something like, oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, I thought that I was here before them, but I might be mistaken. Um, was there a queue or something that I was supposed to sign into? Because I don't want to do things wrong here. You see, I did that. So, so now all of a sudden by me just asserting that, then I, I toss the ball to them and they're going to respond and they're going to say, oh, you know what? I'm so sorry. Were you here first? And probably the other people will admit that they weren't here first. And then we get the whole thing going because I just tossed the ball and I gently tossed it. I just tossed it in a way that was palatable by saying, hey, this is probably my fault. This is probably something I'm doing wrong here, instead of pointing the finger and blaming. I remain calm, but I express myself. I use my voice. And by doing, by doing things in that manner, I'm getting things done. I'm representing myself. I'm showing up. 